I'm Terry Toyota with the World Economic Forum, and I'm very delighted to welcome you all to this inaugural Sustainable Development Impact Summit event, convened here in New York alongside the UN General Assembly. We're particularly excited about this new and unique event that will help move uh, progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals as well as the Paris Climate Agreement. We really aim to showcase and expand some of the best examples of innovative solutions um, and partnerships that harness public-private cooperation and the creative technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. And today I'm honored to be joined by my co-chairs for the summit, uh, which I will introduce briefly in a moment. We'll hear from each one of them uh, regarding their hopes and aspirations for the meeting. So let me start with, to my left, Afsane Beshlash, founder and CEO of Rock Creek Group. Next to her, Madam President uh, uh, Garib Fakim, uh, President of Mauritius. Marianne Jamet, founder and chief executive officer of Spot One Global Solutions. And Stefan Lovin, Prime Minister of Sweden. We're delighted to welcome them all to this uh, summit um, and look forward to hearing from each one of you shortly. <coughs> After all, each of the co-chairs speak. Uh, we'll have some time for questions and answers from the floor. And I will ask that all of you keep to the theme of the Sustainable Development Impact Summit in your questions. There will be time, I'm sure, to catch up with these individuals to speak about uh, their individual organizations or portfolios separately. So, Afsana, let me start with you. Uh, financing has been one of the most pressing and, and hot topics, let me say. Uh, since the Sustainable Development Goals were, were launched. We've heard a price tag of somewhere between $2.5 trillion uh, to, to $4 trillion. This is a lot of financing. Tell us how this platform might be useful to uh, mobilizing additional capital to support this implementation. Thank you, Terry, and I'm, uh, I wanted to thank you. I'm very thrilled to be here with this uh, great group of co-chairs, and I'm looking forward to the next two days, especially the reason I'm very excited about the meetings over the next two days is because we'll be talking not just the, at a very high level about the debate about SDGs, but actually how do we implement them. And financing, obviously, has been one of the reasons that things have either moved or not moved. If we just sort of put the SDGs, as you said, sort of, Three, four billion, sorry, three, trillion. four trillion, <laughs> have to use the right number in uh, perspective. Um, if you look at the size of total markets globally, they are around 120 trillion based on our uh, estimates at Rock Week. So if you think about that sort of uh, situation, and that is increasing around three to four percent, so actually just around the amount that we're talking about <laughs> for the SDGs. Um, it's a very different number than, let's say, my previous employer, World Bank, or, um, or multilaterals. When you add up those numbers, those are in the billions, you know, maybe 100 billion if you add all the multilaterals, and let's not forget those are gross numbers. So you really need a very, very close uh, partnership and collaboration between private sector and public sector and civic society and individuals and academia However, you also need to make sure that the financing is at the global level, mm -hmm. at the regional level, and at the local level, and the individual level. Let's not forget there's going to be 30 to 40 trillion of assets of baby boomers that are going to transfer over the next 20 to 30 years to the next generation. They have very different aspirations in terms of the subject of this summit. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of uh, financing, the only other thing I wanted to mention, Terry, is that in, when you look at sort of the investment world, there are two groups of people. One group thinks that uh, the moment you open your mouth and you use the word um, sustainability or impact, the eyes glaze over, you lose their interest, <laughs> they think that means no return. The other group who knows that there will be returns, that group is having a problem because the data is scattered very difficult to find the data, and that's why one of the initiatives that we are starting is to create a marketplace for sustainable and impact. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. And the numbers definitely necessitate the need for a public-private uh, cooperation here. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. So Madam President, Asane laid out the kind of what's needed to invest in, in countries. How do you invest in people and, and 
what have you found most effective in, you, in leadership of your, your country? Uh, thank you very much, Terry. Uh, again, thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. And great to be in, in also at this forum in New York uh, next to the Assembly. Um, I think Afsana has touched on two very important uh, issues. First of all, the issue of investment. And the other issue that she has touched on is institution. And I think if we are going to, uh, to make a dent in uh, attaining the Sustainable Development Goals, we'll need to invest in both. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to invest in the people, and we, need, of course, need to create those institutions that will end up giving us credible data. Because if you don't get credible data, you cannot develop the right policies. And uh, the continent I come from, if you look at uh, all the indicators, there is a dearth for real big capacity building. Uh, in all sectors, in, especially in the STEMs. I think this is where we need to empower the women. And I will be cliche here, and I think if we look at uh, the issue of food security, I would be very blunt to say that women feed Africa. And uh, so this is where we need to, to bring on board uh, a lot of capacity. But now, how do we tackle this? I come in this space being an academic, being an entrepreneur, so I know the impact of quality research translating into this, the space of uh, entrepreneurship, translating the space of development, and how do we engage with philanthropies as well so as to actually cross the valley of death and create more impact based on academic research. So based on this, uh, from this background, this is where I decided uh, to chair the Coalition for Africa Research uh, in, in, in Initiative. And uh, this is being led at the global level with uh, big uh, names like the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, the USNIH. And more importantly, it is not to be driven only by donors. And this is where we're trying to get on board African philanthropists and also government. Because uh, while donors provide us with the seed capital, we still need the sustainability, and this is rightly the word, to maintain to sustain this effort. And this is where we need government. And government need to come on board with the percentage. I'm not going to give any figure, but you know, we know the, the, the desired figure will be the, the famous 1%. But to go with the Africa uh, strategy of 2063, get government to bring, but of course bring these uh, African philanthropists who want to invest in, in, in that space, but they need to do it through credible people, through credible people who are empowered. Yeah. And I think this is the kind of narrative that we'd like to see emerge uh, from the continent, but notwithstanding the fact that they also come from an island state. Mm -hmm. And here we're talking about the climate change, we're talking about the Paris Agreement, and again, come back again to the issue of funding, because these are global issues, global challenges, requiring national, of course, regional approaches to tackle these. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you very much. And connected to that, I would say, Marianne, you embody many of the aspects that we've been speaking to about the need for entrepreneurship, the investment in, in girls and technology. Tell us what this summit means to you. Thank you, Terry. I'm, I'm so honored to be here. Um, so my name is Mariam Jam. I'm from Senegal. I'm a young global leader. I was born in 1974. And the reason why I'm telling you that date is because I'm data. I'm here as a, uh, I'm, I stand here as a testimony that being poor, being uneducated, being marginalized, being trafficked, is not a barrier to stop you fulfill your dreams and be successful in life. And learning how to code unlocked that for me. This summit is so important. I've been working on the MDGs and Sustainable Development Goals for over 20 years. I was a recipient of aid. I'm going to tell you three things. First, a little bit about my story. Second, why I'm committed to the Sustainable Development Goals. And third, why I am the code is the answer to have girls and women as active participant to the Sustainable Development Goals. I was, I was born in 1974, as I said earlier. I was trafficked to Paris when I was 14 years old. I never had any education. I was in the hand of NGOs all my childhood, orphanages in Senegal. Today, I'm a successful businesswoman in London. And this is just a very short story of my life. The second, why I'm committed to Sustainable Development Goals. This platform is an amazing platform. It's the first time that the World Economic Forum engaged through the Sustainable Development Goals. Because Sustainable Development Goals is for people, is about people. 
young women like me who was growing up in Senegal with no education. I started reading and writing when I was 16. I learned how to code seven languages in two years in the southeast of England, in a Starbucks, in my local library. The Sustainable Development Goals mean so much to me because I know that young girls growing up in Africa today or in Mauritius, wherever they are, they can have an opportunity to learn. This is the book I learned how to code 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I learned my first language of how to code HTML. Today, I am the code. It's in 7,000 7, people. I am the code have 7,000 young women and girls. So that's why I am here today. And in conclusion, what I would like to do is for us to think about partnerships. We are the first organization that I am the code. It's the first organization teaching Chinese girls how to code. The Sustainable Development Goal is not just for us, but it's for all of us around the world. How do you make sure goal number four is affecting young girls? Goal number five, gender equality. All these goals are really important. And so I want to thank uh, the World Economy Forum to fight, for giving me this platform to chair this. I'm here, I'm talking from my heart because they mean a lot to me. And I hope that the press will take that on. A truly moving and inspirational mm -hmm. story, so thank mm -hmm. you for sharing that. And I'm sure that you know there's many personal journeys that will uh, that you'll you'll inspire and motivate. So thank you, Prime Minister Levin. You you've also been a tremendous champion since the beginning of of the SDG, particularly on the implementation and on the action orientation. So you um, I know you you are an initiator of the informal high level group on implementing the Agenda 2030. You also launched last year at the uh, General Assembly the Global Deal, the social dialogue for improved working uh, labor markets. So tell us, what, what does this summit mean for you and what's the opportunity? Thank you. Uh, first, uh, let me say I'm, I'm also very proud to be here as a co-chair together with, with these three colleagues, uh, both a political leader but not least also important uh, non-state actors. Uh, I believe we have uh, so many possibilities with the agenda, but we need to work together. Uh, politicians and civil societies, enterprises, and, and, and so on. Uh, of course, we as political leaders, we, we carry uh, perhaps a particular responsibility for, for implementing the, the 2030 agenda, but we can only succeed if we mobilize jointly together. I'm, I'm convinced of that. Uh, some of us political leaders, we, we um, came together in 2015 to, to, we wanted to make a push for the implementation and to do whatever we could do to make it happen fast, as fast as possible. 2030 sounds like a, a long, long time. It is quite a long time, but time flies very quickly, and there's so many uh, challenges that we had. And we wanted to, to give it a, a flying start. And here are some of the experiences that we have now from working with the 2030 agenda and the implementation. I hope that could be uh, inspire uh, others as well. Uh, I hope uh, that everyone uh, during these two days now will, will explore new partnerships uh, as well as innovative approaches as well as effective policies so that our efforts can, can have much more impact and one such impact, uh, real impact, is uh, the, the SDG, especially on SDG 8, is social dialogue. I think, no, I, I don't think I'm convinced that social dialogue is crucial to make things happen. So together with the OECD and the ILO and with several countries, enterprises, uh, trade unions, we have launched uh, a global initiative on how to strengthen the social dialogue uh, the co collaboration between employers and employees and the employees organizations and for governments to support uh, because I know that that uh, social dialogue enhanced social dialogue will it will benefit decent work yes but it will also increase productivity in enterprises and by that it will also strengthen the societies and we know that the labor market will be key to to shaping our societies, uh, how we manage the continued globalization, which it'll be there, it will happen, but we have to make it happen in such a way that everybody feels, yes, I'm also on board. I also have a good future in, in the globalized world. So uh, social dialogue is a win for workers, it's a win for enterprises, and it's a win for societies. It's a win, win, win. And I look forward also to the Global Deal session here uh, later in the plenary. We, we did launch also, um, 
a new research project, uh, if you want to take part of that, uh, on how social dialogue actually affects business, because that is something we need to look into more. Uh, and I know from my own experience, with a so good social dialogue, uh, businesses will also also win. Uh, and I, I look forward to, to uh, more of businesses to contribute also to that perspective. Thank you so much. Fantastic. And I, I think stressing the urgency is, is a very critical point. So now we will open up the floor. Um, we'll ask you if you've got a question or something on your mind uh, to raise your hand. I'll be calling on a number of you at the same time and then turning over to our panelists. So please, in the front. Thank you so much. Please uh, also state your name yes. and where you're from. Thanks. Thank you. My name is, uh, thank you, Excellencies. My name is Irene Hell. I report for Newspeak Middle East. And I want to thank you all for your big efforts to um, get the goals going. Um, my question goes to the Prime Minister. And um, you're an example that it's possible to work your way up from the bottom to the very top. And you've been a union man all your life, fighting for social justice. Now you fight for the goals. How do you experience when you go to the UN and meet all the world leaders, their atmosphere? Um, did it change? Is there hope? And uh, now you talk to the business community very much so, and this is all a business community thing, like um, you are working very hard too. <laughs> um, so can the business community fix what uh, governments fail? Mm -hmm. And uh, what is the biggest thing um, uh, you are doing? And what are you most proud of? Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll just take a, a, a few questions and then we'll give you. Yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, Mark Engelhardt of the German News Agency. Um, probably my question to, um, to you, Ms. Bifloss, um, is pretty much the same, just the other way around. I'd like to know um, this morning we heard at the UN General Assembly Amina Mohammed saying not enough is being done so far. Um, what is the interest of um, the industry side, and why do you think they should come forward with trillions which are needed? And then lastly, why discuss this in this particular forum, the World Economic Forum, and not, for instance, in the Global Compact, which is already there? What's the benefit or what's the idea behind that? Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah? Okay. Mr. Prime Minister, would you like to start? First, is there hope? Yes. Uh, when we decided upon the, this agenda, uh, I could feel yes. I mean, we have, we have a situation in the world that is very dramatic, problematic. Uh, the climate change, uh, all the conflicts that we see, uh, refugees, uh, we have widening gaps between rich and poor. Uh, that, is, that is definitely challenges, huge challenges. At the same time, we've seen that the, the middle class is, is growing in the world. So more and more people are getting out from the, the extreme poverty. Nine out of 10 boys and girls go to school today. That, was, that didn't happen uh, 20 years ago. So we have, we have uh, plus and minus. But we, there's one thing we know. We need to work together. And I'm talking globally now. That's what we, we must assure. In a global economy, we need to work together so much more. You have to do the right thing at home, domestically but you have to be present outside in the world and work together with colleagues and friends all over the world. That's how we, how we, how we meet this uh, climate change and, and the refugee issues. And so that's, that's what we know. Uh, can the business community do what, what, the, what governments have failed to do? Well, for me, it's, it's, like, it's not this part or this. It's working together. Once again, you need to work together because business community can uh, achieve a lot. But governments have to be there. The political side has to be there as well, as well as, as the civil society, the trade unions. So we have to work, do this together. And that's why I'm talking about the win-win-win. It's a social dialogue. Employers and, and uh, employees need to meet. You need to find a way uh, to adapt, to change, not only to adapt, but to make future, the, uh, the future a better future. You need to be able to, to look forward to the future, not being afraid of tomorrow. You need to look forward. And one way of doing that is to be involved in the dialogue. How do we do this? How do we, how do we, how do we handle uh, changes in technology and changes in the labor market? 
but also give the government uh, uh, an important role. How do you how do you support that social dialogue? How do you support a change where people need training, for example? You need constant training and retraining. We know that that's the, the future of the labor market. Well, that is something for the enterprises, yes, but it's something for the governments as well. So I think uh, the, the crucial thing here is to, to make this social dialogue work together with all these three actors. Very good. Um, what I'll add, I completely agree with the Prime Minister in the sense that it is the private and the public sector collaboration. So to go, taking it from the mm -hmm. other perspective, if you like, in my case, I've worked at a bank, I've worked at the World Bank for 20 years, multilateral, I've worked um, I've been on the board of multiple foundations. I have run an entrepreneurial investment firm. I've worked on private equity, oil company, etc. But I've sort of in the last 20, 30 years, there's been sort of a sustainable uh, threat through all of this. And in my observation, through all the places where I have worked, private sector and public sector, there has been a huge interest in doing the right thing so long as you can measure it. There's always, I remember first day at the World Bank, uh, I think Bob McNamara asked uh, somebody who then passed on to me, could you come up with the poverty indicators for this oil pipeline? It was impossible, I ha and they asked me to make up a number. So I think we have to be very careful because the issue of impact and sustainability does need hard data, does need hard numbers whether you're in the public sector or the private sector, but we need to all come up with a better set of data and information, going back to your point. At the same time, you yourself, if you draw a line and you look at uh, many markets, you'll find that many of the social sectors, in fact, have very high returns. And we'll talk about some of the specific examples mm -hmm. in the next session and following ones. Um, but people who are interested are not seeing those. So why would uh, private industry be interested? They're looking at bottom line, absolutely. They're not going to invest in something that does not have bottom line, unless it's their community affairs or their PR parts. However, they're now seeing that if millennials are interested in buying goods from companies that are taking this sorts of things seriously, they're going to sell more of their goods. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think to just be aware is, for those of you who have been in um, the States for a few days, the cover of the New York Times yesterday was kind of sad because it had um, you know, sort of various uh, multinational companies uh, who cannot sell um, food that makes people obese in the developed countries, so now they are selling it in developing countries, in fact, through networks of women. Yeah. And, um, and the question is, first, do no harm. And I think some of the things we need to discuss are practical things. You said, why should, uh, um, should WEF uh, be involved in this? There's a lot of people talking about this. I think the reason I'm very excited about today and tomorrow is we need to start implementing it's nice to have the high-level debates. It's nice to discuss the broader topics. The question is take examples and actually do them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so it looks like, you're, you know, how do we make this mainstream and how do we build those market systems, whether it's the metrics, the instruments, the, the dashboard that, that makes it look like something that we all currently recognize and, and want to mobilize. Great. Uh, I Sorry, the second part, mm -hmm. why does it need the World Economic Forum to I think because I think all the other platforms, as I was just saying, yeah. and as Terry right. just mentioned, are still at the level of debate. I, I, I'm, and I'm exaggerating slightly. I think a lot of people are looking at, you know, there are some groups in the U.S. and, uh, and globally who are looking at data uh, and measurement of, of impact, um, academics who are doing that. Uh, but I think the role of the forum is very much to um, look at how do you take something that people really want to get done and get it done. I was also a long time ago a, <laughs> a young leader, and I think what I've been impressed by the forum is making things a little bit more practical, not just debate them. And I think, sorry to uh, yeah. finish up, Terry. Yeah. Um, that's why uh, in my day job at Rock Creek, we're very excited about this sort of creating a marketplace and working with governments. We've talked to a lot of companies who are very interested. We work uh, in with a number of foundations, but you really also need uh, governments to be interested mm -hmm. so that there's one place you can go uh, to have open data on impact. Yeah. And that really does not exist because either it's scattered or people want to be very proprietary about their data. Yeah. Marianne, you're nodding. Did you want to come in yeah. there about 
the role of technology. That's true. I mean, that's what I said earlier. I'm, I'm data. If you think about it, I'm now 43 years old. And when I was growing up as a young girl in Senegal, you know, I was actually part of the inaccurate data you saw around the world. And now the reason why it's important, I think your question is very valid, why we're doing this at the World Economic Forum, is because, you know, this is a platform. It's an amazing platform. And for the first time, you know, the World Economic Forum is putting its eye on the sustainable development goals. And the indicators are there. Uh, you know, the targets are there. So we can put, you know, government, when we mobilize government, private sector and investors, you know, we can actually put them into account and say, hey, what's happening in the next 10, 20 years? You know, for example, you know, how do you make sure young women and girls across the world are learning basic digital skills that they will need to be part of the digital world tomorrow? So I think the data is really crucial. And I think that, you know, being here this week, you know, we can measure what goal four is doing, what goal five is doing. And now nobody can hide anymore. And I think what Afshar said is that the data is really <coughs> crucial. And because, like I said, we are the data. We, the people who are growing up in orphanages, in, you know, in, in, in the hand of government, NGOs, now our data is actually out there. Uh, and, and on top of that, you have the refugees data. You have all these people data. Uh, AI is coming. Machine learning is coming. But the people who are on the ground, they actually don't even have access to the technology. So it's really crucial that we focus on tech and innovation. And I think the World Economic Forum is the right platform for it. Madam President. Yes, thank you. And this, uh, again, links up to the initiative of the World Economic Forum for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, because if we are going to talk about sustainability, if we are going to talk about, I'll just take a very good example of the ocean economy. If we want to look at uh, uh, sustainable fisheries, I can see how blockchain, for example, yeah. can help the customer get access to all the information. Mm. And we talk about refugees. I mean, how can you get all the data? together mm -hmm. so that you know they can actually come on board faster so i think we are talking about inclusiveness and we've talked about communication but communication the tools are there but i think increasingly we need to see how to have this dialogue yeah. and this is what we're trying to build on this forum to promote the dialogue and to promote the understanding with the technology notwithstanding the fact that there are challenges mm -hmm. associated with ai associated with all these but i think we need to have this dialogue to see how these challenges can be translated into opportunities Excellent. Final final word from anyone? All right, we'll we'll have to Yep, final final question. Hey, my name is Jean Combe de Alloy. I'm uh, from Tribune de Genève. Um, two questions. So you, you mentioned the need for government and business to work together. This morning at the UN the, the, the two big words were sovereignty and accountability. So the, the movement is going the other way, basically. And second, what is the WMEF uh, going to make different things? As, you know, because the, the talk about girls' access to technology to, has been going on forever. And uh, there's a, a lot of discussions and a lot of goodwill coming out of these summits. And then it feels it fizzled out. So what's, what's this summit is going to make different to make sure, really, that these girls, for instance, are going to have access to technology. Definitely deliver. That's a very good All question. Right. I think I'm just going to answer very quickly. That's a very <laughs> good question. I, I don't, I don't, um, you've been, uh, we had girl ed education. Everybody talks about girl education. But no one has ever talked about STEM education, you know, in the STEM field. And so at the World Economic Forum, we have the, an initiative called I Am The Code, which is the young global leaders who are committed actually to making a difference. And so now the, the, the I Am The Code is actually mobilizing government private sector and the philanthropic foundation to actually invest in STEM education, the skill development of those girls. So really crucial. And it's a really hard topic that they, they're looking into. It never happened before. And so we are actually going on the ground and finding girls, getting girls into coding. Girls can code now if you go to China or go to Argentina, which is uh, you know, very clear. You know, when we had the World Economic Forum in, in Buenos Aires, you can go now and see young girls in Argentina coding in Spanish in five minutes. So we have really real data and real hard facts. Uh, and I think that you know, you're going to see the next five, ten years, the World Economic Forum actually showing you this data. Excellent. Thank you for energizing your, your very rich conversation, your energizing and your leadership. Um, look forward to having you participate over the next day and a half in some very interesting sessions. I think you've given a wonderful preview of what's to come. So thank you very much. Thank you to all. Thank you. Thank you.